start a new series today. Don't know how long it'll go. We were talking about, for a while, talking about intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And I hope you've all becoming more and more intimate with the person of the Holy Spirit. Get to know Him better and better and be more and more aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. Being led, being directed, being guided by Him. Amen? Amen. So I want to talk to you and start this morning about building a strong house. Building a strong house. And I'm not talking about a physical house. If you want to know about building a strong house, see Jesse, see James back there, they'll tell you how to build a strong house. But I want to talk to you about building a physical house, a spiritual house. I'm talking about this house right here. Maybe you understand you are the house of God. This is a building. We can have church anywhere. We can have church in a barn. We can have church in a, in a field. We've had a lot of churches under mango trees, haven't we? Out in the middle of nowhere, we've had church. But you understand, wherever you are, you are the house of God. The scripture talks about in different places like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It says that we are an earthly house. We have this house, this tabernacle. One day this thing's going to go away. But while you're here on the earth, you need it to be a strong house. A very strong house. Why, Pastor, are, are you thinking that we need to have a strong house? Because of the day that we live in. Because of the day that we live in. I, I believe that over the years, so many circumstances and so many things have taken place that we've kind of let our house get a little bit weather-worn. And it needs to be strengthened up and other, undergirded once again. Because the days that we're about to face, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, to me is an incredible portion of scripture talking about the last days that we live in. And Ron, I like the version that you read it to me out of, out of the Passion Translation. I believe it really, really explains it so much better. But talks about the very days and times that we live in and how they're perilous times, how hard to live with times. But in the midst of it all, you and I as the house of God, if we keep our house being built strong, we're coming through on the other side. Amen? Doesn't mean we won't have trials. Doesn't mean we won't have tribulations. Doesn't mean we won't have persecutions. All those things are going to happen. Jesus promised they would happen. But how we face those things and come out on the other side is a big difference. Amen? We come out victoriously on that side. Psalm 91, if you want to turn there, uh, and I'm going to kind of refer back and forth to it and several other scriptures this morning. But I'm going to read to you again out of the Passion Translation, but just verse 1. See, as Paul said that we have this earthly house, and Paul writes again in the Hebrews, says that we are Christ's house. In other words, we belong to Him. We li he lives in us and we live in Him. And then Psalm 91 says, verse 1, When you sit enthroned under the shadow of Shaddai, you are hidden in the strength of God Most High. Don't you love the way that says that? I absolutely love the way that says that. I'm going to read it to you again. When you sit enthroned under the shadow of Shaddai, Shaddai is the many-breasted one. He is the one who is more than enough. I mean, you know God's more than enough. Yeah. Whatever your needs are. Okay? You are hidden in the strength of God most high. I love that. So we find that even though we are an earthly tabernacle, <coughs> that we belong to the house of Christ, that we have our dwelling place in Him, Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. So while we're walking on the face of this earth, we need to learn how to build our house strong. I don't know about you, but I think I've got a few loose boards that need to be nailed up. I, I'm not sure how well my roof is holding out, but I'm sure it could use a little bit of help. But we do need to build our house up strong. And I know the best way to make your house the strongest is to start with a good foundation. That's the best way. Okay? 
So <clears throat> one of the things that we have to understand as we go through, I'm going to get where we're going in just a minute, but I need you to understand about a couple of things. Number one is that we live in two different atmospheres or two different realms. We live in a natural realm and you live in a spiritual realm. You live in a natural realm, you live in a spiritual realm, okay? And so one of the things that we need to learn how to do to build up our house and make it strong is to fill our atmosphere or the realm that we live in with the things of God, okay? So I want to just kind of give you a definition of what atmosphere means because some of you might think, well, he's using the word atmosphere. That's kind of weird. Well, it's really not when you, in our, in our sphere of, of influence in Christianity because when we worship, don't we create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to work in? Right? So atmosphere is not a weird word for Christians. They need to understand it. This morning, as we're worshiping the Lord, I could sense the atmosphere changing. Certain parts of certain parts of certain songs, I could tell when the atmosphere was beginning to change, when there was a shift in that realm, and we were creating that atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to work and to move. That's not a weird thing. That's exactly what takes place, okay? So what we need to learn to do, I just want to say this to you. Write this down. Fill your atmosphere. Fill your atmosphere. Now I'll give, give you a definition of the word atmosphere. It means this. A pervading or surrounding influence or spirit could be a general mood or an environment. I'll read that to you again. The definition of the word atmosphere is as a pervading or surrounding influence or spirit. It's a general mood or environment. <clears throat> Who or what is your greatest influence is going to determine your victory or your defeat in building your house. Who influences you the most? Does the TV influence you the most? Does the news influence you the most? Does the economic downturn influence you? Does the word influence you? Does the presence of God influence you? Does the anointing influence you? What influences you the most determines the atmosphere in which you live in and determines a victory or defeat. Okay? So to, to me, one of the first things that you need to start doing to build this house up is to uh, fill your atmosphere with the things of God. Let Him become that influence. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 1, we discover all about the creation. You've read it in the beginning. Their earth was without what? Form, void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Now I want you to catch a hold of just what I'm about ready to tell you. You need to grab this. Okay, this is so important. Okay, so as darkness was over the face of the deep, this whole place was just dark and it was empty. Okay, and just because that darkness, it was there, it was empty, just because all of that didn't mean that it would just automatically take on the atmosphere of God. God had to fill the atmosphere with what He wanted to occupy that space. Once you grab that, this is important, you get a hold of this. Just because that was there, didn't mean all of a sudden it took on the atmosphere of God. Something had to happen for God to occupy that space with what He desired for it to do. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. I want you to grab that. And God said, let there be light. His word filled it with what God desired for it to be. It wasn't until he said, let there be light, until it became what he desired for it to be. 
Hebrews chapter 3, 11. Let me read this to you out of the Amplified. Listen to what it says in verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intender, intended purpose by the word of God so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. So in other words, until God said, let there be light, nothing was filled with his desired intended purpose. That changed the entire atmosphere. God's word influenced the darkness of the deep. The emptiness, the void that was there, the word of God caused it to become what God's intended purpose was. You say, what does that have to do with us? Oh, it has everything in the world to do with us. Because you and I live many times in a world that seems like it's dark and void. It seems like it's empty. Your body needs healing. Your finances need a miracle. Your relationship needs a miracle. There's all kinds of things that need to be changed in the natural that are going to be changed by the supernatural realm in which you live. So when God spoke his word, it filled up that atmosphere with the desire and the will of God and then caused it to be created for its intended purpose. That's what Hebrews 11.3 said. So it, it works the same thing in our lives. We need our lives to be filled with the desired results that you need by the word. The same way that God brought it about in the world, it's going to be brought about in you and me. It's going to fashion, frame, equip our lives for its intended purpose that God has. So all this time while we're walking around and we're coming across all of these things that seem to be contrary to us, that atmosphere can change you to become like it or you can change it to become like what God's desire is for your life. By the Word of God. That's why the Word is so important. I love stories, but I don't want to tell stories. I want to tell what the Word says. Stories may make me feel good, but the Word's going to change me. It's going to become a sphere of influence for my life and for your life. And the farther that we get into the coming of the Lord and the farther we get into the end times, you're going to need the Word of God to build your house stronger and stronger and stronger. So it's important and imperative that you get the Word on the inside of you. Fill your world with the desired results by the word of God. Remember Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. God called those things that be not as though they were. Speaking about Abraham. And you go, well that was for Abraham, it's not for me. No, that's not correct. If you read down in verse 22 on down the line, it said it wasn't only imputed to Abraham for righteousness, but for us also who will believe. So we have the same power, the same authority that was working in Abraham's life that was spoken by the word of God that changed Abraham's entire world and all of mankind from that moment on. We have that same power and that same authority working within us. So you can't look at your situation and say, well, I guess it's just going to be dark. It's just going to be void. It's just going to be sickness. It's just going to be weakness. It's just going to be poverty. It's just going to be this because that's just the way it is. Okay, you got it. That's the way it will be. But you need to look at that and speak the word of God to change that atmosphere to bring it about to God's desired results for your life. Amen? Got to stand strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. You can just write these down. It says there in verse 13 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, it says, uh, We have the same spirit of faith, therefore we speak. And then he says there in verse 17 and 18, he says, This light affliction works for us uh, for just a moment uh, while we look not on the things that are seen, but we'll look on the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are only temporary, but the things that are unseen work for us an eternal weight in glory. Listen, those are the very principles of the Word of God. Those things... 
There might be sickness there. There may be COVID there. There may be a pain there. There may be this temporary setback in your life. He says, but as long as you look at that, you're going to remain in that. But if you look beyond that to the answer, those things that are warned against you are only going to be a temporary setback. But if you look to the answer, they will work for you in eternal weight and glory. Hallelujah. Amen. So this is the principle that God has for us to live by, living by the word because of that spiritual atmosphere that we live in. Whether you, when you go to work, you live in a spiritual atmosphere as well as a natural well, at home, you live in both of those atmospheres. But it's up to you to determine which one's going to work for you. That's all up to you. Okay? So, you and I can energize that atmosphere by the Word of God. Or, you can leave it blank and leave space for anything or anyone to permeate it. That choice is yours. I'm going to say that to you again so you grab a hold of that. Say, we can energize the atmosphere where you live, whether it be your home, your business, work, whatever, whatever is going on. Okay? You can energize that atmosphere by the word, or you can leave a blank space for anything or anyone to occupy it or permeate it. The choice is yours. You follow that? Okay? I don't know about you, huh? I, I plan on letting the Word of God run in that. Amen? Amen? Matthew chapter 7. Go with me if you will. Matthew chapter 7. Very familiar portion of Scripture. Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine. Now this is Jesus talking, so he's talking about whosoever hears the word. Okay? Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Everybody say, does them. That means you, you just don't only listen to a sermon, but you put it to practice. You just don't read the word, but you put it to practice. You just don't quote the word, you put it to practice. Okay? I will liken unto him like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the wind flew, and beat upon that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. Okay? <clears throat> now that house, because it heard the word, acted on the word, hearing and acting made the house stable and able. Made the house stable and able. Okay? <clears throat> and it could stand against all negative influence. Follow that? Okay? And that negative influence is what tried to permeate that house. Now watch this. You've got to see. The storm didn't just pass over the house. Notice the language that is used in the King James. I don't know what other version you're reading. But notice what it says. It says that that storm, look what it did to it. The wind blew and beat on that house. There happened to be a poem. poem. Yeah, they were big just whooping on it. Okay? <laughs> they were whooping on that house. Every, all these circumstances were coming against that house. Doesn't say that it was uh, absent from the storm. Didn't say that none of the storm didn't fall on that. It said all the storm fell on I might be understood. All hell wants to break loose over your house. But notice what happened to that house. That storm had no effect on that house. None whatsoever. Listen, you and I are going to go through the storm. Just like the three Hebrew boys. They went through the fire. But what happened to, to those three Hebrew boys? Not a doggone thing. They came out not even smelling like smoke. But what happened to those who put them in? They died. What happened to Daniel in the lion's den? He curled up next to them kitty cats. 
What happened to the guys who threw them in? They became cow can. <laughs> Friskies or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> they got eaten. Was Daniel absent from persecution? Were the three Hebrew boys absent from persecution? No. Nope. Was Jeremiah? I mean, you read all the way through the scriptures. Was Peter, Paul, and Mary? <laughs> Peter, Paul, John, the rest of them, were they all absent from any of that? Not at all. They were in prison. What happened when they were in prison? They sang praises unto God. They were released and all the prisoners around them were released. Every time they met with persecution and trials, they stood by the word of God. So in the days to come, we know we're going to expect some homo, homo, I can't even say that word. So, huh? Pummeling. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can expect some pummeling from the, from the dark side, but it doesn't matter because my house, this thing right here, is going to be permeated with the word of the living God. Amen. And when trials come, I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to stand on the word. I'm going to stand under the shadow of the, of the most high God. Amen. Amen. So the storm didn't just pass, but it attempted to destroy. Now you'll notice in verse 26 through 27, the house next door became ruined. Why? Because they didn't build a strong house. It was a weekend. It was a house of cards. What makes it a house of cards? See, you can, break, you can build your house out of bricks. You can have that thing, you know, with rebar every two inches on center and have the highest tensile strength of concrete. And I can build mine out of bamboo and mine will stand in the storm while yours will be destroyed if you don't stand on the word and act on the word. Okay. Follow that? Because it has, no, it has nothing to do with the material. It has everything to do with what you do with the word of the living God. So the very first key that you and I need to have in building your strong house is that you need to fill it with the word and you need to act upon the word. Amen? Okay. Whose responsibility is it to get the word in you? Don't you dare point your hand at me. Thank you very much. It is your responsibility. My responsibility is to teach you, to equip you for the work of the ministry your responsibility to receive it and do it. Amen? Okay? So, now once this house has been built, now we have another responsibility. It's called protecting it. We need to protect our house. How many of you would protect your house? Do you lock your doors? Why do you lock your doors? For protection. Right? And if... You would protect it from fire, you would protect it from vandals, you would protect it from burglars, you would protect it from any intruder that would be coming in. Whose responsibility is it to protect your house? That's right. Whose responsibility is it to protect your house? That's right, exactly right. So we have to protect it. And the same way that we protect it or built our house, we will also be protecting it by the word. Look at Psalm 91 verse 4. Because remember, we're dwelling in Him. We're living in Him, right? Okay? And He's living in us. Look at verse 4. Again, out of the Passion Translation, it says, His massive arms. Don't you love that? <laughs> His massive arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. You can run under His covering of majesty and hide. His arms of faithfulness are a shield, keeping you from all harm. Wow. I like that. And in King James it says that you are living under the protective covering of his wings and that he is a shield and that he is a buckler unto you. So <clears throat> we see God has a responsibility of protecting us, but you have a responsibility of believing the word that God is your protector. And so therefore you can't live in fear. Remember fear is not an emotion, fear is a spirit that tries to get you to not believe what God's word says. Okay? So there he says that we're going to live under the shadow of his wings. Under the shadow of the wings of Almighty. You know, 
Jesus talks about that in Matthew's Gospel in the 23rd chapter, where Jesus said to those people in Jerusalem, he said, oh, I would, rather, I would have loved to have protected your children just like a hen protects or broods over her chicks under its wings. You know, that's what a chicken does. It'll bring its chicks right up under itself, and it will hold them there in a place of protection under the wings of that hen that will protect its young ones, the offspring. How many of you know you and I are the offspring of God? Hallelujah. And God wants to protect us. He wants to watch over us. Even if you go back to creation there in Genesis chapter 1 where it says, over the face of the deep the Holy Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. He was protecting what God was creating. Now maybe understand that God's greatest creation is you. You're God's greatest recreation. And he will bring you under his protective covering. Oh, he, like the, the Hebrew word there, we talked about the, the Holy Spirit watching over the face of the deep. That word there is either the word hovering or the word brood. In other words, it is a protective and it is also an intimate term dealing with reproduction. And in the Hebrew, it is a very deep word. It's pretty amazing. So God is not only watching over you. But he wants to make sure that he is continually being versed in you. That's awesome. Think about that. Okay? So, he wants to protect you. He's your shield and he is your buckler. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the term buckler means something that is before you, it's beside you. And it's behind you. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, out of the Passion Translation, again, speaking about the armor of God, he says, take faith as a wraparound shield. I like that. Take faith as a wraparound shield. Now, the word is the only way that you and I can have faith. For faith cometh by hearing and what? Hearing the word of God. So we understand that when we hear it, we need to hear it again. Because he said it comes by hearing and hearing. It's repetitive. So we need to continually hear the word in order for faith to come to the inside of us, right? And he says there in Ephesians chapter 6, Take the shield of faith in your King James, wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. So there in the Passion it says there that he becomes that wrap around shield. Now notice what it says that you're to do in order to have protection. I like what it says. It says, take. It's there, it's available, but you need to reach out and you're the one that has to grab it. You're the one that has to do something with it. I can believe with you, but it's you who has to make that final stand. I mean, if you ever prayed with somebody or prayed for somebody, and you're praying in faith and believing God, but nothing has happened. You know why? Because many times they're doing this. <coughs> Pushing it off. Because they don't have their receptors up. They're not believing God with you and they're walking in negativity and going with what if, but, what about. You all know what I'm talking about. You have to stand in faith and that individual who you're praying for also must have faith for what you're believing God for. So you need to Walk with that wraparound shield. You need to get yourself encased in the very things of the Word of God. You need to just allow for the protective power of God around you. Now, I'm going to say something, and please don't be offended by what I say. If you are living in fear, you're not dwelling in the secret place as you should. i say that again. If you are living in fear... You are not dwelling in the secret place as you should. Because while you stay in the secret place of the Most High, you are living under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord. See, there's your faith in action right there. What are you saying of the Lord? He is my shield. He is my buckler. Under His shadow, I will live. I will dwell. His shield shall be my shield. It shall be my buckler. 
And it goes right on down all the rest of the benefits that he lists in those 16 verses in Psalm 91. Of everything that God wants to give unto you and change the atmosphere where you live. So if you are walking in that element of fear, and again, I, I, I'm not meaning to say this to be offensive to you, but maybe it's a wake-up call that says, I need to get back to living and dwelling where I should be dwelling and causing my life to be changed by the very presence of God and the Word of God in my life. Amen? So when you dealt, see, because when you dwell in that secret place, your language changes. When you dwell in that secret place, your language changes. You no longer own that sickness. You no longer own that poverty. You no longer own that pain. You no longer own that negative circumstance. You don't say that, oh, that thing is killing me. Or my allergies. Or my arthritis. Or my whatever it is that you're going through. See, you've owned it as soon as you said, oh my. But when you start dwelling in the secret place and you're building your house and making it strong by the word, your language changes and you do what, what the writer of Psalm 91 says. He said, I will say of the Lord, He is. Everybody say, He is. He is. Amen. So your language changes and when your language changes, your circumstance changes. A couple other things that I just want to throw out here on how to protect yourself. Protect yourself, number one, by, by the Word. We already saw that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Protect it by the Word. How about in 2 Peter 3, 7? It says that the Word holds secure the world. God is holding everything in place. By the word. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It says that he holds all things together. By the word of his power. Everything around you right now. Is being held in place. This gravity that we have. Or what's happening. And how, all the stars aren't falling out of the sky. And you haven't get hit in the moon, head by the moon lately. Or any of that kind of stuff. Because the word of God is holding everything together. I've told you this before. And I'll say it again. Is that they can't, discuss, they can't figure out. What hold, they can split it at them, but they can't figure out what holds it together. I can tell you what holds it together. The Word of God. So if the Word of God can hold an atom together, don't you think it can hold you together? I most certainly think so. Okay? So you just hold on to the Word. Protect your house by the Word. Find all the scriptures that deal with this household. Of what God wants to do in protecting you and watching over you and keeping you. You find those and then you start making them something that comes out of your mouth and then acting upon them. Okay? Now the way to protect your house is by the blood. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. Remember, during the Passover, that, that Passover lamb, it was sacrificed and they were told to do something with the blood. They were to take that blood and they were to put it on the the doorpost, and they were to put it on the lintel. They were to put it on those two side jams and the header that goes over that doorway. And the scripture says that when the death angel passed through that land, and when he saw the blood, he said he would pass over that house, and no destruction would come under that house. You and I need to know the authority and the power that is in the blood of Jesus. I'm not only born again by the blood of Jesus. I'm not only having my sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But there is a protection that is over my life that is by the blood of Jesus. And when we walk down the street, every demon in hell sees the mark of the blood that is upon your life. And the only way that he gets through that causes you and I to walk outside of the protection of the blood is when he lies to you and you believe his lie. I mean, you know, the devil is a liar. You have a mark of the blood of Jesus upon your life that is eternal. It is internal. It is there forever and ever and ever. It is God's precious mark upon your life that seals you in with God and seals the devil out. Amen. The scripture says that when uh, the serpent comes in and bites someone, it's because the hedge has been broken. 
You and I break the hedge of the protection of the blood of Jesus when we sin and when we get in a doubt and unbelief. So we need to make sure that we continue to walk in faith and declare the power of the blood of Jesus over our lives. Amen? Another way to walk protection is, again, both by the word and by the blood. It tells us in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, it says they overcame him by the what? Blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony and loved not their life even unto death. So we know it's by the power of the blood and by the power of the word of God, by the word of your testimony. What is the word of your testimony? The word of your testimony lines up with what the word of God says about you. Okay? Another way that we can walk in protection and protect our house is by the name of Jesus. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10 says that the name of the Lord is a high power. And the righteous run into it and they are safe. Glory to God. I mean, you know, when you start mentioning the name of Jesus in faith, not just flippantly using the name of Jesus, but you use it in faith. The scripture says it's by faith in his name that this man stands before you whole. So it's not just the name, but it is faith in the name of Jesus. So when you're feeling like you're in trouble, you just begin to start crying out in the name of Jesus. Run into the name of the Lord. It becomes a high tower, a strong tower, and you and I become safe. Glory to God. Another way for protection is by uh, trusting God to send His angels. Psalm 91. Once again, look at verse 11. If you're still there. God sends angels with special orders to protect you wherever you go. Defending you from all harm. Woo! Glory to God. I'm going to tell a little story here. Years ago, 1973, I went up to Fairbanks, Alaska to build some house, houses for an airline pilot up there. And me and three other, or two other guys, and we drove the Alcan Highway. You can imagine what that highway looked like in 1973. <laughs> oh, is that a road? <laughs> and we, we were driving one of the guy's pickup trucks, and he had a camper on the back. And it was just a camper shell. And those two guys were sleeping, and I'm driving. We're in the Yukon Territory. That is some nasty country. And uh, I'm driving along, and there is no pass-through window from the camper shell to the cab of the truck. I'm just sitting there driving this truck and all of a sudden I fell asleep. And the next thing I know is my face got slapped. Literally got slapped and woke me up. Now, I wasn't saved. I believed in God. I was just a heathen kid, but I still believed in God. But God sent an angel to slap me in the face, to wake me up, to keep us from dying. Because if you've ever driven through the Yukon Territory, you don't last long sleeping at the wheel. That is the roughest country I have ever seen in my life. But God wanted me to stay away just long enough to come to Murphy and torment you. <laughs> My wife over here. She's going, I'm glad you did. I'm glad I, 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 I knew her already. I already knew who she was. I had no idea I was going to marry such a beautiful woman. God had plans for brightening up my life. Amen? Amen. But I'm going to tell you, that's what God will do. Even when you haven't committed your life to Him, God has a plan for your life. I didn't know to quote the scripture, he'll give his angels charge over you, keep you from uh, any harm. I didn't know that. All I know is that the only explanation that came into my spirit was God sent somebody to wake me up. They couldn't. They were in the back sleeping. They had no idea what was going on. You trust God. You trust him. Believe the word that says you have an angel. Remember, God appoints angels over cities according to the number of the inhabitants that are there. 
that every person in this place right here has an angel that's been assigned to you to keep you in all of your ways, all of your ways, all of your ways. Amen? Next thing to protect your spiritual house is by protecting the atmosphere. Now, this is where you're going to go like, what? You need to protect your atmosphere. In other words, screen your influences. Screen your influences. I know the popular word today is bet on. Bet your influences. <laughs> In other words, those people or things that are coming into your life, not just individuals, but what you watch, what you hear, what you read, you need to screen those things that come into your life. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable worship, and be not conformed unto this world, but be ye metamorphosed. Transform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what we need to do is we need to screen what comes in. Get our minds renewed. What is truth, what is not? What we hear, what we don't, shouldn't hear. What we speak, what we shouldn't speak. Those things all become influences. Who you hang out with can be the same thing. John chapter 17 and verse 17 is another one that Jesus prayed. Remember, John chapter 17 is really the Lord's Prayer. Because he prays for the church in John chapter 17. In John 17 and verse 17, he says to the Father, Sanctify them through your word, for your word is truth. So, sanctify means to set apart, to separate, to make holy. So, we need the Word of God in us. There it comes again, right? You just can't get away from the Word, right? Sanctify them through the Word because your Word is true. So, you need the Word in order to show you, along with the person of the Holy Spirit, what is truth and to be led in truth and to walk in truth. Okay? That will protect your household. You're screening what comes in, what doesn't. Sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart. Psalm 119, verse 37. I love it. And again, it's in the Passion Translation. It says this. Psalm 119, verse 37. Listen to what David cries out. Help me turn away my eyes from illusions so that I pursue only that which is true. Drench my soul with life as I walk in your path. Wow. That's powerful. I'm going to read that to you again. Because this will really to help you by protecting your atmosphere of what allows to come in. When you give God permission to do this. I mean, you know that God is a gentleman and he doesn't violate you or your will. But when you cry out to him with this prayer and says, help me turn away my eyes from illusions so that I only pursue that which is true. Isn't that good? Drench my soul with life as I walk in your path. Wow. I like that. Drench my soul. I just want to just soak up what he wants to drench me with. And then I want to drip on everybody around me. <laughs> drench us with the love of God. The power of God. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it's an amazing thing what happens is we build our house like this and we get our lives in order. It's amazing how the anointing becomes uh, even more powerful in your life and the sensitivity to the things of the Holy Spirit because now your life is lining up with what the Word says and the Holy Spirit endorses what the Word says. Amen? So, uh, I'm going I'm to end here. We're going to start next week is that dealing with God's covenant 
of protection over your life. How many of you know that God has a covenant of protection for you? I'm just going to explain to you real quick what a covenant is. I'm not going to get into the technical about the blood covenant. But I'm just going to give you a definition of what, the co what a covenant is. A covenant is an unbreakable agreement between two parties that have been joined together as one to support, protect, and defend each other. And you have a covenant with God. God has a covenant with you to protect you. And we're going to talk about that next week. Okay? Because your house needs protecting. But the first thing to do is build that thing strong on that foundation of the word. Amen? Okay. So we're going we're gonna to continue with that next week. And uh, I believe in God that all of our houses in here are going to have such a firm foundation. And I don't care which big bad wolf comes. He's not going to blow your house down. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the authority of your word. I thank you for the authority of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Father, for every person in this place or every person that has heard this, even over the airways, that, Father, that they are getting their house in order for the days that we are about ready to face. They're not going to wait until the storm comes and try to collect everything. But, Father, they're going to have their house prepared and ready for when the storm hits. Because we know it's coming, Father. Just that we want to be prepared for it. So, Father, we just ask that you would just speak to the life and the heart of every individual in this place. Right now, Father. To show them what they need to do. To be prepared and ready. And strengthen them, undergird them, wherever they're at. Whatever they need to do in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 This morning we have a special treat.